Now we want to turn to another pair of stories in this case. And this is a pair of stories that occur in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 35, and continue on through chapter 19, verse 10. Keep in mind the fact that our chapter headings were put in by the Byzantine church somewhere in the 4th or 5th century. We're not quite sure when. They're called the Kephalia. And before that, we didn't have any. The copies of the New Testament before those were put in, the text is just straightforward text. There's not even any space broken between words. So when the Greek scholars put that in 400 years later, sometimes they got them in very good places and sometimes they got them in peculiar places. In this case, I'm very sure that we have two stories that are meant to be seen together. One is the story of Jesus dealing with the oppressed and the second is story of Jesus dealing with the oppressor. They both happen in Jericho, and we are meant to read them together. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed, and there was no one to comfort them. And on the side of their, oppressor, on the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. The author of the text is concerned about showing comfort both to the oppressed and to the oppressor. It's rather an amazing text. We see Jesus, in fact, filling out that story. So what is the first story? The story of the blind man. Jesus comes down the road to Jericho, and we're told there is a great crowd. It's easy, as many have done, to see the great crowd as meaning a lot of people followed him from Galilee. That may be a part of the story. But also from my 47 years living in the Middle East, I know that whenever a very important visitor comes to town in a traditional Middle Eastern village, it is expected that the leading citizens of the town are to go out of the town, greet the guest, and then escort the guest into the town. This is kind of like uh, your football team wins the Super Bowl, and when the team comes back on the airplane, you're going to have a huge crowd of thousands of people out at the airport to welcome the famous team that won the Super Bowl. That same custom is carried out uh, many times in the Middle East. So there is a crowd that has come out of Jericho to meet Jesus. Why? By this time, he's a national figure. Everybody knows that he claims to be the Messiah. In their mind, the Messiah is supposed to reinstitute the kingdom of David. And Jesus is going up to Jerusalem on the feast of Passover. Now, Passover for us doesn't always quite mean what it meant and means for the Jewish community, because in the spring they had Passover, and Passover was the remembrance of their political liberation from Egypt. We lived in Israel for 10 years, and the mood of Passover is, whoopee, we got out of Egypt, yay! In the fall, for the Jewish community, there is Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the solemn recollection of our sin and the atoning sacrifice which takes our sins away. For us as Christians, our Passover is our Yom Kippur. But for Jesus in his time, the Passover is the day you remember you got out of Egypt. Aha! The messianic pretender is on his way to Jerusalem on Passover. Is he going to make his move? Are we going to start the revolution? Does he have a deal with the zealots, an underground, semi-underground movement trying to get revolt going? Or does he have a, duel, a deal with the sekarim, the violent fringe of the zealot movement, who were ready to assassinate anybody who stopped their nationalistic uh, enterprise, trying to reestablish the kingdom of David. And they want to talk to Jesus. That means someone has prepared a banquet, and they're going to discuss religion and politics through half the night, 
and it's going to be a big fancy banquet, and anybody in, in, in uh, the town, Jer in Jericho, is going to be present. So a blind man beside the road, begging, hears the crowd, and he says, what's happening? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. The man cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knows that Jesus has had mercy on many people in need, and he gives this great cry. It's an unusual cry. Son of David occurs only rarely. Here we have it. And the crowd tells him, shut up and sit down. He doesn't get time for people like you. He cries out all the more, and Jesus hears, and Jesus does not go to the side of the road. Rather, he summons the blind men. That is, he instructs the people who are telling him to shut up and sit down to escort the blind man to the presence of the Messiah. It's a nice touch. He turns the people who are oppressing this man into courtiers to present him to the king. And when he gets him in front of him, he asks him rather an amazing question. The question is, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do? Well, the guy's blind, for heaven's sakes. What do you mean, what do you want me to do? You see, in our Middle Eastern world, begging is considered a recognized profession. And the beggar offers his services to the community. Everybody's supposed to be pious, and everybody is supposed to believe in God, and everybody is supposed to give alms to the poor. Now, if the poor aren't out there, how can you give alms to the poor? And so the beggar doesn't say, hey, bud, you got a buck for a cup of coffee. He says, give to God. I've got nothing to do with it. You're not giving to me. I'm giving you an opportunity to fulfill your religious duty before God. And the beggar always sits in a public place where a lot of people go by. And if you give him something, he will stand up and in very polished phrases, he will ask God's blessing on you and your family and your guests and your business and your investments and your health and your going out and your coming in. And you will be praised as the most noble gentleman he's ever met in his life. Now, you may not be the kind of person about whom such very nice things are being said in a loud voice in public. And it ought to be worth at least a dollar, for heaven's sakes. It does make you feel kind of good. However, if you're going to take up this profession, there's got to be something wrong with you. In no way do I mean to diminish the suffering of the poor who end up beggars in the Middle East, but I do notice that they generally are on the stout side. They manage. Something visible wrong with you is required. One arm, mm, iffy. One leg, you might make it. Sore lower back like I have, won't do, it's not visible. Blind, perfect. Guaranteed lifetime income. Now, what if you are healed and you can see? You've got no education. You have no skills. You have no work record. You have never been employed by anyone. You've never done a day's work in your life. And what are you going to do? One of my students ended up a Baptist missionary in Bangladesh, and on five different occasions, he told me recently, he found beggars at the side of the road who, as children, had fallen into the fire, and their legs and their arms had very bad scar tissue, and they couldn't stand up. And he saw that a doctor could heal this with a few, a few, uh, a few surgical procedures and a few skin grafts, and he volunteered. He said, I will take you to the hospital, and I will pay for the hospital, and when we get done, you're going to be able to walk around like a decent human being. And they all refused. Why? It's their profession. What are they going to do next? Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Are you blind men willing to take on the fresh responsibilities that come with the grace of God. That's what he's asking him. And there are time and again, Jesus does exactly the same thing with the people who are around him. He asks them an exam. Do you want to be healed? That's what the exam is all about. 
The blind man passes the exam. I want to see. He is healed. And he goes on praising God. And notice, Jesus has slapped the wrist of the crowd. You who marginalized this man, I chose him for special grace. And the crowd absorbs the criticism and goes on praising God, and they proceed to the banquet hall. No. We're told they entered Jericho, and Jesus was passing through. I taught for the last 10 years in the Middle East, an ecumenical institute just outside Bethlehem, and we had uh, Ex-President Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter, and his wife Rosalind for guests in the afternoon. We were allowed to serve tea for them, and we took the dining room and moved all, most, all the chairs out, most of the tables, and everybody who knew how to baked goodies all week long, and you can't imagine the pile of goodies that we had. The meetings ran late, the Carters walked to the dining room, Rosalind picked up one cup of tea and took one sip, and off they went to the next meeting. And there was no joy in Mudville that day. What are we going to do with this mountain of cookies, enough to feed an army for a week? That's what happened in Jericho. Everybody's disappointed. He didn't have time to sit around all night and talk to us. There's still time for him to make the 17-mile hike up to Jerusalem, and he wants to make it before dark. Well, what can we do? Aha. But there's one guy in Jericho who really wants to see Jesus. And he is the town collaborator. The Romans collected, collected taxes by farming it out to local people. At the end of the year, you give us so much money and we won't ask any sticky questions about how much you took in. It was a system that was guaranteed to have oppression, injustice, and graft. This man is the town collaborator. He's short. It's not just he can't see over the crowd. He's a powerful man. Powerful men stand on the viewing platform. But he doesn't dare enter that crowd because he's short and he's the town collaborator. What's going to happen to him? The quick flash of a knife, the stifled cry. Nobody finds the body until the crowd is gone and you can't arrest all 5,000 people. We discovered this when we lift, lift, lived on the West Bank amongst the Palestinians, and they were under military oppression from the Israelis, and they had collaborators, and the collaborators never mixed in crowds. They always had careful check as to where their back was, wherever they went, because people knew them. So this fellow doesn't dare enter the ground. What's he going to do? He does two very unusual things. First is he runs. When you're wearing long robes and you are a distinguished gentleman, you don't run. But he runs down a back street. No one's going to see him. And he runs out of town. We know it's out of town because the rabbis said you can't grow a sycamore fig tree in town. Why? It has big branches. The branches go out over the street. And if the tree's in your backyard and sitting under your tree, you eat some dates that haven't been tithed, then you, or you touch something that's dead and you become ceremonially defiled, the defilement would go into the tree and anybody who walks under that tree out in the street will become defiled in the process. So this was a tree that has big branches, close to the ground, big leaves, but it has to be some distance from the town. It's the only tree we have in the Holy Land that's got big leaves. And because it has big branches, you can get into it easily. It needs a very hot climate to grow in, and Jericho is below sea level and it's very hot. They have these trees down in Jericho. Zacchaeus climbs a tree. He picks a tree with big leaves so that he can hide. Why? He doesn't want anybody to see him. Powerful people do not climb trees at parades. Little boys and little girls climb trees in cultures all over the world. It doesn't happen in our culture. The crowd, he hopes, will be dispersed, but it isn't. By the time Jesus gets there, the crowd is still there. And the crowd spots Zacchaeus. 
How do we know? We know because if Jesus can see Zacchaeus, so can the crowd. And the crowd is calling Zacchaeus' name. And what do you think that the crowd has to say about good old Mr. Zach now that the polecat is treed? All the things they wanted to say in his office for the last 30 years, they couldn't say because he's too powerful. Now you can hide behind the person in front of you and you can call out any four-letter words you like and one insult triggers another and pretty soon they're starting to get angry and there is a whiff of violence in the air. And Jesus is expected to respond. And he's supposed to say, Zacchaeus, the anger of this community is fully justified. You have broken the law of Moses. You have become the town collaborator. You are draining the economic lifeblood out of your own people and giving it to their enemies. And you deserve this and more out of this community. What is required of you is to quit your job, go up to Jerusalem, go through the week-long process of ceremonial purification because you and everything you touch is now defiled, and come back, get a job within the confines of the law, and purify your house, and if you do that, the next time I come to town, I will drop in for a congratulatory cup of tea. Audience response. That isn't what happens. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, I didn't think I had time for anybody in this town. But I've just changed my mind. I have decided that I'm going to accept your gracious invitation to be your guest for the night. So, he doesn't have time for us. He has time for the town collaborator. And he's on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate our political liberation from Egypt. And he's now going into the defiled house of the defiled agent of the Roman powers. And this gross political indiscretion is not going to be forgotten. And there's plenty of time for us to get word up to Jerusalem about this indiscretion. And when he gets there, the big boys will be able to take care of him. Did you notice that the anger against Zacchaeus is shifted to Jesus? They were angry at Zacchaeus. Now they're angry at Jesus. Isaiah the prophet said, by his stripes we are healed. Two things have happened to Jesus. He is a Jew. He is a part of his community. He understands their oppression under Rome. He sympathizes with it. He grew up in a world which despised the tax collector more than anybody else. And the rabbis even said, you're allowed to tell lies to three people, and one is a thief, and the other is a murderer, and the third is a tax collector. I thought about putting that rabbinic note at the bottom of my income tax last year, and then I thought, well, perhaps better not. In any case, they were on that kind of a list. Jesus feels the feelings of the crowd. But Jesus has reprocessed his anger into grace. Having done so, he is now able to reach out in a costly demonstration of unexpected love. All four words are critical. It's costly. It is a demonstration. The deepest things cannot be spoken merely. They have to also be acted. It is unexpected because Zacchaeus didn't earn it. And its nature is love. And by the time you get those two sides of that coin, the reprocessing of anger into grace and the costly demonstration of unexpected love, you have huge components of the reality of the power of costly love seen in its ultimate expression 
in the cross and in the resurrection. Zacchaeus comes down out of the tree and he is joyful, we're told. Authentic repentance is acceptance of being found. It's not remorse over a broken law. A lot of people get this confused. Jesus has already redefined repentance in the parable of the good shepherd who finds the lost sheep and then Jesus says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repent, repents and the lost sheep is a symbol of repentance. The lost sheep gets lost, the shepherd comes after it, picks it up and carries it back to the village and the sheep he thinks it's going to die, thinks some wild animal is going to eat it, and it accepts to be found with great joy. Zacchaeus accepts to be found with great joy. There is a place for remorse over sin, but the initial emotion of repentance is joy and not remorse. What happens? They go into Zacchaeus' house. You have to fast forward in the text. And they recline because they are at a triclinium, a big wide couch. Even middle class Jewish families by this time were using the Greek triclinium for their banquet meals. And Zacchaeus feels the inner pressure to respond. Now nobody tells him what to do. Nobody gives him a new set of rules. Nobody gives him a new law book. He's got to respond. And in the middle of the banquet, the pressure to respond is so intense, he speaks out of the depth of his own soul and promises to clean up his financial act with the community. He doesn't respond out of who somebody else is. He responds out of who he, uh, he is. The Ten Commandments are still out there. There is a law of God in Christ to love God and love our neighbors. But we are called upon in Christ to go beyond what the law requires of us, the law of love. And when Jesus sees that his repentance is authentic by the nature of his response, Jesus gives the final statement. And says to him, today salvation has come, passive, to this house. Who brought it? Jesus did. How? At great cost. We are talking about one of the deepest levels of the cross. Since he also is a son of Abraham, the rest of the community was denying him that status. Abraham was one who started out in a journey not knowing where he was going. And that's what this man is doing. He is starting a journey not knowing where he is going. The Son of Man, he's talking about himself, came to seek and to save. He came, that's Bethlehem and the Incarnation, to seek and to save, that's Jerusalem and the atonement. And the two are brought together, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, in this great story in which we see our Lord coming and we see him reaching out to seek and to save. Amen.